Hello, and welcome to the last day of the summer school. What a great week it was. We heard from 20 speakers across different research and operational teams. We had our very own intern speak on the panel, and we heard from you. You were very active from day one, so engaging, so interested in our work. Our EER team that you met the other day, Tim and Gleida, are still going through all your questions and comments, and they are planning to publish via LinkedIn a mini paper answering all your questions, just so you know how seriously we take your questions, so please keep an eye out for that. We currently have, I believe, over 300 active projects, so we have barely scratched the surface of what we do, but hopefully this has given you a valuable insight into our work. Before we dive into our next session, I wanted to give a shout out to one person who truly stood out this week with his proactive initiative and great personal style. Navid, I hope you are online and you can hear me. I just wanted to say I truly admire how you connected with us at Chatham House on LinkedIn how you wrote summaries each day of the school and you provided your own comments and reflections on the topics and by doing that you created not just a great professional um, record for future employers to see but you have also shown that you can take initiative and that you have drive and maybe Navid next time can you also join us on the panel and give a presentation on how to stand out from the crowd and how to develop your personal style. Instead of us presenting on this, I think you would also do a great job. So, so well, well done, Namid. Now, over the course of the week, we tackled a wide range of topics and issues within international affairs. But many of you have said that you are eagerly waiting to hear from our researchers working in the Middle East and North Africa program including Leah, who wrote to me last night with some very thoughtful questions and concerns on the situation in Yemen. I am truly delighted to introduce my colleagues from the Middle East and North Africa program who are joining us today. Dr. Sanam Vakil, Deputy Director and Senior Research Fellow, and Tim Eaton, also Senior Research Fellow with the program. Thank you very much to you both to join us, for joining us today. What a great way to close, close this week, the summer school week, with um, an overview of yet another huge topic. So where do we start from? Thank you very much, Alice. Um, it's a pleasure to join you all today. Um, Tim and I are looking forward uh, to, in a very short time frame, trying to tackle uh, some of uh, what we see uh, to be um, the most important uh, challengers, uh, drivers um, of conflict in the region. Um, we cannot do uh, the Middle East and North Africa justice in, in the time that we've had, we have. Um, so apologies for not being able to cover everything. Um, I think we are both, um, uh, still students of the region, above all, um, always learning new things um, every day. Uh, so uh, we're just going to highlight um, some important um, dynamics um, and then hope that we can um, answer some of your questions and have a discussion amongst ourselves. Uh, so uh, with that, I think we can begin. Um, the region, of course, is very diverse. Um, it can't be reduced to the, um, the labels that you oftentimes hear about in, in the media um, or in this reductive way that many um, uh, political leaders often uh, refer to the Middle East. Um, uh, this is one slide that sort of captures um, the diversity of political systems that are represented um, throughout the Middle East and North Africa. Um, we have uh, civil wars ongoing in three states, uh, Syria, Libya, and Yemen, um, and, and these sort of uh, jump out at you. But um, across the region, I think the most common theme is that these are not democratic states writ large. In fact, most have um, uh, 
some uh, large um, autocratic um, footprint uh, managing uh, the political system. And I think this is a big driver of protests um, and frustrations um, throughout the region. This is sort of another uh, look at uh, some of the same issues um, captured by Freedom House um, that uh, monitors um, different um, important um, uh, issues like free press, uh, freedom of expression, um, assembly, petition um, in, in around the world, but particularly if you sort of zoom in and look at the Middle East, um, the color that uh, jumps out is that um, these are states that are not free, uh, that you don't have um, protection uh, to speak freely, uh, to protest freely. Um, they're only um, two countries that sort of jump out in a different color, um, and that would be uh, Israel, uh, Tunisia, and um, Jordan, uh, that is uh, categorized as being partly free. Um, I think also, uh, if, if we zoomed in a bit more, Kuwait would also be categorized as partly free as well. But in general, you sort of get the picture um, of uh, some of the uh, principal problems um, for uh, ordinary uh, citizens in all of these countries. Finally, um, from my uh, point of view, this is also an important um, issue looking at um, the economic angle um, in the region. Um, I think traditionally um, and historically, a lot of analysis has looked at uh, the region, dividing it between oil exporter um, economies versus oil importer economies. Um, but you will see um, at the bottom of this graph, um, levels of unemployment being quite high. Um, and um, at the same time, you can also uh, see that um, there is a huge uh, uh, young population on, on the alternate access. Um, uh, at the same time, there are certain countries that are um, resource rich uh, with smaller populations um, and younger populations. And this poses uh, challenges uh, for a governance for a social contract and uh, obviously also for creating employment. Thanks, Sanam, and hello everyone. It's it's great to be with you today. Uh, so Sanam just kind of broken down some of the broad looks at the Middle East, and often what we hear about in our coverage of the Middle East is the ongoing governance crises, is conflict, is uh, things related to uh, extremism and gen violence writ large. But then also when we think about the Middle East and North Africa, often in, in the economic discussion, it's about oil and it's about pressing concerns, what's happening right now. Whereas actually when you look, take a deeper look at the other things that are happening in the Middle East, there are broader things as well that are kind of unfolding that maybe don't get the attention that they merit. This slide here indicates the population growth that's anticipated in the region in the next um, in the next 20 years or so really and you can see quite startling percentages of increase in population Iraq 220 percent increase in population huge numbers which will create massive challenges for these states already beset by large governance crises and still feeling the effects of either ongoing conflict or instability for me, this is the most startling graph that I've seen on Middle East and North Africa. The fact that such large numbers of its population are under 30 and even under 15 poses major challenges because what are these people going to do when they enter the marketplace? Can these countries establish a functioning economy that will allow them to be productive? And what happens if they're not able? We'll talk probably a bit later about the nature of some of the governance systems, which are often a, a divvy up of power and, and money between a relatively limited number of people at which the broader population pays the price. And I think if you look here, you can see that a large number of these, uh, these young people are not in education, employment or training presently, which shows how really these countries are actually managing some of these challenges, which is not well. The number of jobs a country like Egypt has to create every year just to sustain the same level of unemployment is a really, really massive challenge. And this is kind of an example of the research and interest on the Middle East that you won't often hear, at least in the Western press. 
Similarly, the Middle East is very vulnerable to issues related to climate change, just as many other areas of the world. Of course, its economies in many places, as Sanam indicated, are dependent upon hydrocarbons, oil and gas. And so that um, will create a massive uh, challenge to transition, linking back to what I was just mentioning as well on the demographic and employment front. But here, uh, and I'm certainly no expert on these issues, but taking some slides from my colleague Glader, who looks at these issues closely, you can see already the real problems that are present in the region in terms of water, just one uh, natural resource. And I think if you look at um, this example of uh, the Levant and, and the Israeli state in Palestine, you can see already the stresses on these um, resources and how scarce they are already. So another massive challenge for governments in this region to navigate and the kind of challenges that will require major, major uh, partnerships, cooperation, and programs to na navigate. So we've shown you a bunch of um, graphs, and I think as Sanam indicated at the beginning, uh, it's not that simple, and we are not, I think it's very difficult to make big statements in the Middle East. Sanam pointed out that we're still learning, and in fact, most of my work looks at Libya, and honestly, every time I think I understand something, I find something out the next day which illustrates that I don't. Um, this is a, a kind of a, a joke from a, a prominent Twitter um, uh, tweeter, the big pharaoh, where he just tries to point out some of the contradictions between certain relationships in the Middle East. Often we end up simplifying it. Israel wants this, Lebanon wants that, Iraq says this. Whereas actually, of course, these are very, very, um, you know, broad countries and there's a lot of diversity of opinion and contending opinions. And so once you really start breaking it down, it's not that simple. And I particularly like this uh, one from Carl Sharrow, um, Carl Remarks. If you don't follow him on Twitter, you should if you're interested in the Middle East, because he's brilliant at taking the mickey uh, over analysts like myself and Sanam for the things that we get wrong and often the perspectives that we, that we mess up. Um, particularly uh, the, the map in the bottom left, I, I enjoy. I certainly don't think that there is any risk of a big uh, growth in vegetarianism in the region in the, in the near future. But just to say, this is kind of a warning to not just divide up the region as along the classic lines. It's much more complicated than that. Thank you, Tim, uh, for walking us uh, through, I think, uh, those really important themes, um, which hopefully we can circle back to and, and talk about more in depth. Um, we, uh, or Alice was very kind um, to uh, pull you and ask you uh, to respond to a few of our questions. And uh, Tim and I were uh, discussing these earlier, your responses, and we were um, very um, excited uh, to see your response, particularly to this slide, because you're asked to um, weigh in on what you see to be the biggest uh, challenges um, to uh, countries in the, in the region. And um, I think quite rightly, you, a majority of you identified uh, governance as a principal challenge. And I think that um, if, if we had this poll uh, conducted um, throughout a number of regional states, um, governance would uh, probably also be um, high up there in list of responses. Um, ultimately, um, and while I'm being very general, I think most people um, around the region, despite their national, ethnic, um, a religious um, orientation, um, ultimately are looking for accountable government. Um, and a voice for themselves, um, prosperity, hope for the future. And, many of these states, this is what's missing. Um, climate change, you've also um, pointed to as being a really important issue. Um, and I think it's going to grow in importance in the years to come, as you saw from the slides that Tim um, just drew to our attention. And of course, uh, conflict and, and security um, identified by 35% uh, of you is um, uh, clearly a, a really important uh, challenge in the region with wars that have been going on for um, well over a decade in certain circumstances. So um, well done to all of you for uh, being able to uh, uh, identify uh, the things that oftentimes are very um, much missed by policymakers. 
Um, we also asked you about um, how, uh, in your opinion, um, should Western countries help the region? And um, here we were also uh, struck uh, by your response, um, the general response um, being that the majority of you think that there should be greater support, uh, be it financial, economic, and diplomatic, um, on uh, governments of the region um, to pursue reform. Uh, this is, of course, uh, easier said than done, and uh, perhaps we can talk in, in the Q&A as to why this is easier said than done. And this is, of course, very much connected to internal um, shifts um, that have emerged within individual states, regional competition, but also international competition. Uh, but yes, in an ideal world, um, there should be, of course, uh, some uh, pressure, multilateral pressure, to encourage uh, um, reform, uh, but it, again, easier said than done. Um, we also um, oftentimes are asked, um, I, I also teach um, um, at the graduate level, and um, I think we're all asked, you know, what should you read? How should you try to engage uh, and better understand the Middle East? And there's so many books. I mean, to, to be a scholar of the Middle East is sort of, um, in my opinion, it's a commitment, a lifetime of study. Um, but uh, I always um, suggest to my students what my PhD advisor um, told me to do, and I think it was very good sage advice. First of all, um, learn, learn the languages because it's really important to be able to communicate um, and to read uh, what's being written um, in the region. Secondly, travel to the region, spend time there, live there. And of course, in this current climate, um, that makes it uh, difficult. Um, but hopefully, if you do become passionate about the region, you can um, add that to your uh, bucket list of things to do. But finally, I think uh, reading above all, um, uh, there's so much uh, misinformation and disinformation out there and governments are very much involved in trying to control their own narratives um, and histories. Um, so um, I generally think that reading novels and literature, sort of the best way to understand what um, is going on at, at, at um, uh, social level, understanding different drivers um, within society, uh, different sentiments, different um, political thoughts and challenges. And so we have provided um, a list of our favorite books, our favorite novels um, that range from um, Iran to Turkey to Egypt um, to uh, Saudi Arabia We try and Libya. We're trying to give you a breadth of um, countries that you could sort of delve into and read, uh, read from uh, voices uh, within the region. Thanks, Sanam. Um, so we also asked Alice and the team to solicit some areas of interest for our discussion that's to come because Sanam and I were given the brief of talking about the whole of the Middle East in from his, all history till now. So we were terrified by that prospect and also wholly unable to cover it in any meaningful sense in that time. So we asked for a bit of guidance over what might be of most interest to you guys, and you gave a similarly broad list. Um, but what we thought we would do is perhaps drill down into three things that came up uh, from a number of you, and then hopefully that'll stimulate some ideas for Q&A to follow. And one of the main things that came up was what about the role of external actors in the Middle East? We hear a lot about the US should do this, the UK should do that. What about EU foreign policy? And so, starting off, Sanam, what's your take then on US influence in particular in recent years? And, and you know, there's often talk of a, of a vacuum being created that's being filled. How, how do you view that? I think it's a really important question. Another one that we could definitely delve into for an hour, but I'll try to do it really briefly. Um, of course, um, we are uh, living through and witnessing massive uh, shifts in U.S. Um, foreign policy, um, particularly to the Middle East. Traditionally, um, particularly since World War II, the U.S. Um, was uh, increasingly invested, became increasingly invested and developed relationships with a number of Middle Eastern countries, uh, traditionally monarchies. Um, and um, over, over the past few decades um, has developed strong um, alliances and partnerships with a number of states in the region, particularly Israel, um, also Saudi Arabia. Um, I think those are, I think, 
two important ones to highlight, but it's not just limited to those two countries by any means. Um, and over the course of uh, the past uh, 20, 30 years, the U.S. has increased its military engagement in the Middle East um, to protect the interests of these allies and partners. And that was um, first seen in the 1990 first Gulf War, um, where the US um, took a very strong military presence um, and, and stayed in the region after that. Um, but um, since then, um, there's been some sort of rebalancing taking place. Of course, there was the 2003 um, Gulf War where uh, the U.S. invaded Iraq, and that um, sort of began a, a turning point um, that I think is important to focus on, and I'm, I, I think I'm belaboring this a bit, but um, because of the U.S. experience in, in uh, nation building, um, and it hasn't been an easy experience or fluid experience or a successful experience, there has been a, a um, retrenchment in the United States, a rethinking about American um, commitments abroad. And so um, what we are now witnessing is a very gradual rethinking about America's uh, security interests in the Middle East. And by um, uh, through this rethinking process that is our domestic process in the United States, um, the U.S. seems less inclined to be uh, militarily present in the Middle East. Um, and this is, of course, fostering a bit of insecurity among uh, the U.S.'s traditional partners, but also um, opening um, creating openings for other countries like Russia and China to enter the scene. I mean, this is my reading of it. Tim, what do you think? What do you make of uh, uh, the U.S., but also the role and influence of other countries, including Europe, uh, the United Kingdom? Yeah, I think what you've highlighted there, there's, there's clearly some broad trends which we can look at in terms of core U.S. interests that might be shifting over time, less dependence on oil from the Middle East, and therefore less of a less importance applied to what's happening in the Middle East. What I've also really come to learn over time is that there are different parts of a state that often have their own policies that don't necessarily mesh together. Working on Libya, I saw at the beginning of last year when a, a fresh bout of war broke out that you had one message from the White House or one part of the White House even, another message from the US military and the security infrastructure at the Pentagon, and then a completely different message from the State Department which leads to then incoherence and miscalculation. And so quite often we hear different parts of state architectures say different things because they care about different things, what's happening in a country. Certainly what I have noticed though, with the broader uh, dynamic that you've noted, Sanam, of slightly yet less US engagement, that has been taken as a green light by other regional powers to try and fill that vacuum. And that's allowed them to do things that they wouldn't have done previously for fear of US backlash. And we can see that also be reflected in the reduction of the effectiveness of any multilateral institutions. So again, just on a, on a Libya example, that countries have felt able to openly flout UN Security Council resolutions without any fear of them really being taken to task. That has had a real major implication on the regional players appreciation of what happens and what the scope of their action is and I think that's really ch that's that's changing and that's had quite negative impacts because I think it's led to more conflict. So I think the next we were going to look at there are several questions asking um, about Iran which is definitely uh, very much your wheelhouse and something you've followed for such a long time so closely but then also um, the Saudi-Iranian relationship. So I wonder what's happening there. You know, often we hear, you know, Sa Saudi Arabia versus Iran in the region, a sectarianism, a sectarian split. Um, Oversimplistic, how, how should we view that? Um, well, it's a hard one <laughs> to unpack, but let's see. Um, I, 
I see Saudi Arabia and Iran sort of as mirrored countries. They're, they're very much pitched as, as uh, being opponents, um, competitors, and they are competitors. Um, but they're competing because they're very much beset with similar issues. Um, uh, and I, I should say that I very much reject um, often this reductive interpretation that their conflict is driven by sectarianism. Sectarianism um, is instrumentalized in many ways by both of these states um, as part of their conflict, but it, I don't see it as a driver of the conflict. Um, and so if I go back to the idea of Saudi Arabia and Iran being similar, um, they're similar because they both um, I think are autocratic states that um, have governance challenges, have young populations that uh, are in, um, in need or, or seek um, uh, jobs for the future. Um, these are states that uh, struggle um, to uh, meet uh, the needs of this younger population. They use uh, religious ideology as a tool to uh, sort of provide uh, them the leadership with political legitimacy. Um, and at the same time, um, they're both competing in the region, um, uh, sometimes overtly, sometimes uh, covertly, um, but uh, and have been doing so for um, well, well before the Iranian revolution of 1979, but competing for influence. Um, and so it's hard to see um, that these issues are just going to fall to the wayside. There has been, um, in recent memory, uh, a period of rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and, and Iran in the 19, decade of the 1990s. Um, that didn't last very long because I think that um, ultimately what's missing um, uh, is a, a, a sort of a principled agreement um, between both countries um, about uh, sovereignty in the region, about respecting boundaries, about respecting um, each other's interests, um, about uh, recognizing each other's legitimacy, both internally um, inside their countries, but also externally. Um, and frankly, um, it, it's going to be quite hard to unravel um, this conflict in the current uh, climate of um, sort of unilateral American policy um, and also um, uh, co greater competition uh, between um, other actors like Russia and China um, in the Middle East. So um, it, it's hard, to, you know, long story short, it's hard to see an immediate solution. Doesn't mean it won't uh, come to fruition. Um, I think ultimately, though, if both states um, are, which are really driven about, um, most directly, um, uh, towards preserving their security and stability. Um, if, if, if they come together and recognize that they have the same um, uh, imperatives, uh, then uh, perhaps there could be a more collaborative environment. Um, but, um, you know, I think that's going to take a bit of international mediation um, and uh, a greater push for regional security architecture in the Middle East. Um, I don't think I did that justice, Tim, but I think that we should turn to uh, looking at um, some of the economic challenges in the region. And you have worked uh, quite a bit on um, issues uh, like corruption uh, in the Middle East. Um, you've uh, looked at the informal economy, smuggling across borders. Um, can you... Can you explain um, and talk us through um, how big uh, of a challenge corruption is um, throughout uh, the Middle East and North Africa? And are there um, countries that we can draw lessons from? Thanks, Sanam. Yeah, I think this came out in a number of questions or issues that were raised by the students. And my view, uh, which I've come to now, is that corruption might actually be the wrong word for this. Because if you think about it, our idea of corruption is that there is a system that works and functions, but there are some bad apples within that system who are stealing some of the money. And the policy solution, therefore, would be remove the bad apples and the system works. I think actually what you see when you really start to peel off the layers of states within the Middle East and North Africa is that actually these states function exactly as they were supposed to function. In most cases, we see that the structures are designed to filter money to specific constituencies, personalities, communities, 
and not designed on a consensus of public good. Mm -hmm. And this is a major problem. And we see it, that, that means it's very difficult to reform those structures. And we, you know, there's a lot of theory around this, around structures of rentierism, where mm -hmm. effectively you know, populations and constituencies are paid off by, by rulers and ruling networks. And that's something that we see across the piece. Often actors and their groups want to be part of the state in order to access that money, particularly in oil rich states. Being part of the state means being able to get your piece of the pie. And um, one um, anecdote which was really insightful to me is that a lot of the time the arguments of liberals in the West are that you should grow the economy, you should open up. This will create a bigger pie so that everybody's respective piece is worth more. And I was told directly by a former prime minister uh, in, in somewhere in the region that the problem was that there's a fixed pie mentality. Nobody's interested in growing the pie. They just want their 8% to turn to 10% or 15%. And this defensiveness means that there's a lot of opposition towards any kind of reform because it's seen as a threat, no matter how clear the imperative is for that reform to come. And I think here, someone in the, in the um, audience asked about Lebanon. And I, I understand we have some, um, some people from Lebanon in, in the audience. So I think you can see this really clear in, in Lebanon, where you have a pact among elite actors that's been in place for decades, which has enriched those actors and enabled them to basically build their and, and sustain their constituencies, but has meant nothing good for the population overall, because there hasn't been a consensus or focus on public goods. And this is a problem I think we see across the region and something that we would like to work on more in Chatham House, but we've tackled from different ways because often you see from a Western lens, certain things are seen as good, legal good, illegal bad. But if the law is established so that it enriches a specific coterie of people, is that really good? Mm. And if I'm in a border region somewhere in the Middle East and North Africa, and all I have is the informal economy and outside of state control, is that necessarily bad? Uh, so what we've been trying to look at is really what this means in terms of outcomes for people, uh, which is a complicated issue, but something which uh, we, we think is a really uh, important thing to study. That's really fascinating, um, Tim. I think uh, we're going to try and maybe take on some questions, right, Alice? Yes, let's do that. I see many hands are up in the air already. So let's dive straight in. Utkarsh, if you can unmute and ask your question, please. My question is regarding the economy. And uh, I'm sort of looking at uh, the perspective of the IMF and World Bank and how they've been involved in the Middle East. Uh, could you talk about the uh, structural adjusting programs that the IMF and World Bank, you know, they, they talk about, they champion it, and it's uh, that you know they've been working in many countries but has it really been working in the middle east from uh from what i know is that they've been giving out loans and you know they've been talking about privatization and how to open up trade which can benefit these countries as it as it worked tim would you like to take that yeah I'll, I'll start um so i think for me what's interesting here is the philosophy around those types of interventions which are often referred to as neoliberal reforms. In the Middle East and North Africa, of course, what we see are quite big states where historically the state's been a major employer, relatively limited uh, private sectors in a lot of the countries in the region, and often quite high subsidies and other handouts from the state. And in many cases, we've seen pressure from the IMF and the World Bank to reform these structures and privatize. But Going back to what I was mentioning before, actually in a lot of places you see that this has happened, but in a way that retains the same hold over the economy. So whether it's in Syria and you pe see people like the maternal cousin of Bashar al-Assad, Rami Makhlouf, then getting monopolies over supposedly private institutions and then um, state favours in order to access those contracts, or whether it's in Libya where you see state enterprises enter into $175 billion worth of development projects, but limited to a coterie of individuals who were authorized to do so by Gaddafi. You can see that whilst the theory of the IMF and the World Bank may be one thing, 
the actual practice and the way that it translates um, comes out very differently because at the end of the day, many of the regimes in place don't see um, it as being in their interest to remove their controls over the markets that they dominate. And a, a very important issue as well is what happens to the safety nets. So if the IMF comes in and, and says Egypt has to take um, subsidies off of fuel upon which many people rely, that puts the price of fuel up and that creates opposition and um, hardship for populations with the states often not in a very good position to offset that with other offers. So it's also brought with it um, a lot of challenges for popular unrest, which has meant a lot of these countries therefore um, are very reluctant to really follow through in that way. And similarly, you know, that's also why, um, uh, why they have, haven't really happened the same. Sanam, one of your thoughts on that? Um, I think that I think you've you, you've answered that really well, Tim. Um, I think uh, maybe if we could take one more question. I unfortunately have to sign Absolutely. off um, for another event. Uh, so um, I think if we move on, and then I, I leave you to continue uh, okay. to carry the mantle, Tim. No problem. Let's let's call Arian next. Arian, can you ask your question, please? Hi, um, I was wondering about how will the current Gulfs um, ideologically in the region, you say, you know, Iran versus Saudi Arabia, or you know, and everywhere else, sort of that complex little diagram at the beginning, everyone being intertwined so you know heavily to everywhere else. How will perhaps the Middle East be restructured and sort of boundaries be reformed in order to try and um, sort of ethnic and geographically um, different pockets of sectarianism and this that, and the other be sort of? Because normally, if you take you know Tunisia's uh, role historically is very had very strong institutions, for example, and that's why perhaps it's, it's put, been put on a trajectory where it's been more stable um, uh, and more democratic in compared to places like Libya or or uh, or Iraq, where these were sort of very much imperial polities and formed without really the the consensus of the people who actually lived there. So, how do you feel that will perhaps transpire in the future? Thank you. Sorry, that was a bit. I was waffling for a bit, but thank you. Um, maybe begin to answer that and then um, hand it over uh, to Tim. I think it's an interesting question. Um, I do, um, I mean, I think in one of the many prisms that you can break down the region, you could definitely uh, look at states that are stronger um, with stronger history um, of institutions, uh, stronger um, central states uh, with using a Weberian um, sort of a prism uh, to look um, at uh, the, these countries and um, countries with uh, stronger states, um, you know, benefit from having uh, strong institutions. And um, this uh, might not lead to um, effective governance, but um, it, these states are much more resilient um, and, and flexible um, at, at the same time. Um, so, I mean, first to look at your question of boundaries and, and geographies, yes, there, there are many states that have been constructed um, uh, artificially, perhaps, and um, uh, there is a lot of frustration in, in many countries about the artificiality of borders. Um, but uh, because, in my opinion of the region, because there's so much, there's a predominant autocratic um, political system in most Middle Eastern countries, um, I, I struggle to see uh, the boundaries of the Middle East as being um, mutable in any way. Um, and uh, it, it will be uh, very difficult for these strong states to surrender territory. Um, this is, you know, modern sort of Western um, concept of the state um, is monopoly of force, but also um, having um, uh, strong, stable borders. And uh, uh, I, so I see the, the geography as being uh, less fungible. What um, weaker states perhaps um, will be doing, um, you know, once conflict is reduced is to try and develop um, stronger institutions um, and uh, more uh, transparent processes. Uh, this is, of course, a very difficult and um, lengthy process where sort of um, maybe on a very... Um, 
a long-term spectrum, seeing that play out in a state like Iraq um, that is going through sort of the fits um, um, and struggles of uh, developing stronger institutions. And you can see that with this, the political dynamics um, and the negotiating playing out between different factions at the um, elite level, but also um, the, uh, pro the, the, the dynamics between the state and protesters and the fact that um, a younger generation, maybe more marginalized generation, frustrated generation um, that doesn't like the way the state is governing and representing um, uh, their needs or providing for their needs is pushing back. And so, um, you know, I think that these are some of the fault lines um, that we are going to continue to witness, um, in, in, I think, in the coming decades. But Tim, I mean, you also uh, work so much on Libya, but also uh, follow uh, political issues um, in Yemen and Iraq and, uh, and far beyond. Uh, what do you make of this question? Because it's quite a difficult one. And I do have to apologize to everyone. Unfortunately, I do have to sign off. So it was a pleasure speaking with you. And I hope um, to see you again uh, at Chatham House uh, at some point in the future. So thank you all for joining in. Thank you and bye for now. Okay, bye bye. Bye, Sanam. Tim, we also had a lot of questions to follow up on Sanam's point. On yeah, I think Sanam um, made the point. I think there is also a debate about what constitutes the state. Um, so the, I, the um, questioner asked, you know, is it because Tunisia has stronger institutions that it's been more um, impermeable to conflict? is the reason that it has stronger institutions because there were, are fewer divisions? Is it because of um, legacies from a colonial era? And is it really the institutions that make the state? And there's a debate here. So um, I noticed in one of the questions from um, the students, someone asked about Orientalism, um, always a good question. Um, if ever in doubt in a Middle East discussion, throw in Edward Said, it will always work. Um, <laughs> But you see, there's often a suggestion here that in the West, we're projecting about what a state should be. We expect that a state in the Middle East should look like this, a state in the West. And there are quite different historical trends, of course, and maybe it's not the right way to look at it. And actually, sometimes uh, looking at it in this way can perpetuate problems because it effectively incentivizes the consolidation of power by one set of people over others. And I think, frankly, one of the biggest problems in the Middle East today is the absence of a functioning social contract in the majority of areas. And similarly, we see in other parts of the world that there are other models than the Western model, for example, in China and in Russia. And there, so I think there are a lot of different trajectories we can go here, but my experience is that for the most part, the actors have been slightly more rational than ideological. I'm personally quite skeptical about some of the ideological arguments. I don't, I don't think it's because they don't exist. I think that perhaps um, most of the decision-making is a bit more rational um, than that. Thank you. It's possible. What would you believe to be the future of that social contract then, um, if it does not lie in, because of course you're projecting that sort of Westphalian system onto the Middle East, which has no history of that, um, which I completely agree with. Um, which isn't my fault, but um, <laughs> you believe to be that the future of the uh, sort of that uh, social contract which you speak of. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. That, that's okay. I think I'd probably be earning more money if I knew the answer to that. But um, the, I think we're going to see in a place like Saudi Arabia at the moment. Saudi Arabia is starting to institute sweeping reforms and starting to in, introduce a system of tax. So that might be interesting to follow uh, over time. Will it be able to switch to a model? Because you know, there's the old adage, uh, no um, representation, sorry, no, no representation without taxation. I might have got that the wrong way around. But anyway, I mean, the system in the Middle East being rentier up until now, where the state gives things in return for being able to monopolize power is something that isn't sustainable with the economic trends, the demographic trends, and the climate trends that I laid out earlier. So something is gonna to have to give. And here's where the indicators aren't currently that good because for the most part, because of that fixed pie mentality among a lot of the top leaders, they're fighting over 
what is there now rather than actually looking further ahead. And in some ways, I think our policy um, focus on constantly on the conflict and where things are now can obscure those dangers coming further down the track. But clearly, to answer your question directly, there will have to be some kind of societal arrangement in each of these states and a significant degree of reform in all of them for them to be uh, more functional and to avoid the trap of conflict and future cycles of violence. Thank you, Tim. There is also a lot of questions about not just your work on Libya, but also that the Libyan civil war and the situation in Yemen and the situation with refugees is not really covered much out in media. So why is that? And also what, uh, what role does Chatham House plays in sort of raising awareness of various issues and providing that sort of platform for, for debate? I think that last point about a platform debates for debate is important. One thing that I would say that's important for the uh, audience as well is to note that Chatham House is not an advocacy uh, agency or group. So there clearly are a number of international advocacy groups such as um, uh, you know, Amnesty and others who are very focused on key issues and amplifying uh, their voice to get these issues out there. Chatham House is very much concerned with the, the status of policy, informed debate and means to solve problems. And that's a slightly different um, approach. Going directly to the question about refugees in Libya, why, why isn't it covered more? Well, actually, I think if you were Libyan, well, I know this because my Libyan friends are often very annoyed by the fact that Libya is only discussed when, it's, when abuses of migrants and refugees are, are, are discussed. And th that's not justifying any of those abuses. But there's also a civil war going on with hundreds of thousands of people displaced. And frankly, Western policy in Libya has been to stick to force the migrants to remain in Libya so that they don't come to European shores, no matter what the cost, in complete and flagrant violation of EU commitments on human rights and other international agreements, which for Libyans shows the true colours of European states they don't believe in these things, these values that they propagate. They believe them only when it's convenient. And so I think there's an innate hostility towards that. But certainly I've covered this issue quite a bit. I've done quite a few interviews with human smugglers operating um, in and to Libya. And um, I think, you know, one of the things that really comes across to me is, you know, how frank they just see it as a business. Again, we have these ideas about what people are like, I think, from Western coverage. If I were to mention human smuggler, I'm sure most of you, for most of you, that would cover, connote an image which is really, really negative, bad people. Um, but if you look at the language they use amongst themselves, the smugglers call themselves transporters. They call the migrants passengers. And they say, the passenger comes to me, wants to go from A to B. I give him a price and I move him. What's the problem? Uh, clearly, there are a lot of abuses as well. But I think taking away that kind of normative lens of, of um, the values that we ascribe to really look at actually how it works is really important in our work. So that's something that we, we spend a lot of time trying to do. There is a lot of questions about the young generation. What can the young generation do? I mean, I'm just reading one question here, you know, about um, prevent as much you know, conflict in Palestine or be more engaged or, or have a voice. Uh, we have a lot of questions on women's rights as well uh, in, in that area. Maybe some comments on, on, on that, on youth and engagement. Yes, um, I mean, be more interested actually to hear from the, the students themselves over what they think is needed and should be needed, certainly I think we're all products of our uh, own environment. And, you know, I don't think I fit into the category of youth anymore, sadly, but um, so your ideas change. And I think there is always a need for fresh ideas into the debate. And there's also a need for understanding different perspectives. I think any initiative which amplifies the voice of, of young people and helps them to cross divides and discuss societal issues 
that are at the core of the governance challenges in the region are, are tremendously valuable. Because I think as I've highlighted along the way, the young will, suit, will at one point become the governing class. And certainly at the moment, if you look at the average age of the rulers versus the average age of the population, that isn't sustainable. And so there is going to be a new generation and that generation needs to learn the lessons of the existing and previous generation, which is still in power. At the same time, that's an optimistic message and absolutely students should be looking to be proactive. But there are also structural things at play here. There are limitations. We hear debates, for example, over the agency of people from the region. Can they actually change this? If I'm a young Palestinian person, can I escape the structural bounds of politics and international relations to make this or that change? Um, and that's honestly very difficult. You can see where the boycott, divestment and sanctions efforts of Palestinians, for example, an entirely peaceful um, initiative has been blocked by political opponents. And so I don't think there's an easy answer here to this question. And, you know, there are always going to be limits, but at the same time, the point that I always make is that external actors looking to come in and divide um, certain countries, whether it's, um, whether it's in Palestine or others, well, if they're always to see, get a receptive audience and local actors are always willing to accept external support to take on their opponents locally, then that's going to be very difficult to un unfold. If there is a greater degree of unity locally, then the amount of external interference will reduce. And that's not to say it's simple, but it is something worth bearing in mind, I think. I think maybe we could bring some voices from the region as well to this call. Uh, Mohammed Hacha, maybe if you can uh, unmute your microphone and ask the next question, please. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, it's quite my honor asking a question. I'll make it fast. Uh, so I'm from Lebanon, and I'm not going to ask a typical question about what's going on right now and how we're going to fix it, but rather uh, we the people that are on the scene in the streets in Lebanon have seen a kind of police state rise from between the ranks of the government and there is no media that's covering it no research centers that are covering it and to be honest this is a phenomenon that is that we've been seeing ever since the west started to withdraw from lebanon kind of uh, like 2006 let's say and i was wondering how can we shed the light on that because i know lebanon has a lot of other problems but now with the rise of a police kind of state or with the fear of a rise of a police kind of state how can we as the youth kind of try to defend or raise awareness on this issue thank you Mohammed. it's a great question i think um you know clearly there is some coverage of what's going on in lebanon and i think from speaking to people in country if i spoke to libyan friends they would say that there's nowhere near enough coverage of uh, issues that are happening there. The, the advantage is that you have that you are you're from the, the country. You understand what's going on, and so you should feel you should write. You should try and explain these things to people and look at, look at those developments. I think that's a really positive way um, to go about it. I, I'm aware, of course, of a lot of movements and and things going on in Lebanon. And to be honest, coverage in policy is a bit cyclical you do tend to see like a crowd that moved from one country to another, depending on what went bang most recently. And I think um, Lebanon hadn't been getting a lot of that attention. Lebanon wasn't making the international um, story uh, front pages for a long time. And I've noted, for example, that so there are a lot of very, very good Lebanese analysts of politics and dynamics in the region who have been working on other countries for a long time, who are now starting to work on Lebanon once again. And so I think that that, that attention is coming, but sadly it always seems to come when something really negative happens. Um, that's not to say that there aren't opportunities for reform in Lebanon, and I'm sure you understand those issues much better than I do and the, and the difficulties that come with them. But I think personally, as an analyst, I would say this, that the more that's out there, the more analysis, the more argument um, that's in the public sphere, the better. Because 
for those who have stolen billions of, of dollars over decades and still sit in their, in their palaces, there needs to be something which, which, which moves that. And um, yeah, I think that that analysis will, will help. Uh, just a quick thing else, uh, where can we find this platform that we can like write or express on? Like, for example, I am kind of in a, a online magazine that's reporting this, but it's not big enough for like people in a higher position to notice it. So where can we seek to give this attention or at least try to give this attention? You'll have the opportunity to ask Fatima a good question on that in, um, in a few minutes, because um, that's the kind of thing that Chatham House would like to support. And um, we have been through different projects to bring voices from the region, oftentimes who um, write in Arabic, obviously and understandably, um, to allow them to reach a, a Western audience. So um, yeah, I'd suggest you, part, you send that question to Fatima in a few minutes time. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Let's go now to Mariam. Mariam, can you please ask your question? Um, hello. hello. Uh, thank you so much. That was, that was really informative. Um, I, was, I kind of had two questions. Um, I was wondering kind of um, firstly about what you were saying about rentierism and um, you know, these economic systems that are designed to work just in the way that you know, they were you know, created and things like that. Um, you know, what, um, where could we read, you know, more about that and things like that. Um, but then also, how do you see the sort of development of the Middle East going um, in terms of collaborating um, with one another and potentially with like external bodies? Like, how do you see that developing over time? Thank you. Okay, uh, the point on rentierism and um, the structural elements, there's a, there's a rich academic literature on that. It's a lot of it's actually decades old though and I think um, certainly it's something through um, our work that we're focusing on again I mean a lot of my work is political economy analysis so that's kind of my bent but also colleagues uh, like Renad Mansour are writing about the nature of the Iraqi state um, if you wanted to read um, an example of my views on this I've written a paper on Libya's war economy which tries to explain these competitions and how they've shaken out in the post Gaddafi era. There's also a, um, a paper by my colleagues, Renad Mansour and, and Peter Salisbury, which look at Yemen and Iraq as, as chaos states, um, looking at trying to deconstruct this Western ideal of what the states actually are and what they should be to understand how they, how they function in reality. So I think that would be an interesting um, take for you. And the, the advantage of the think tank uh, reports is that there are only 30 or so pages rather than 300 of the academic tome. Um, in terms of cooperation, uh, great question. Um, we, we, I think you can see at the moment that there's a degree of block building and um, oppositional um, politics in, in the region, which is not new, but goes in cycles and sometimes is reconfigured. Sanam's already gone into some of the details of uh, Saudi and Iran antagonisms. Uh, you have second order effects of that in other countries, be it Lebanon, be it, um, uh, be it Iraq. You know, that's, that's clearly a big issue. In, in Libya, for example, you now have France combined with an Emirati um, and Egyptian bloc on one side effectively in Turkey with some Qatari financial support on the other. So the trend at the moment, unfortunately, is for blocks of opposition. And for someone who studied history, which I did, you can see very similar debates about what the structure of the Middle East should be security-wise, politically, and shifts in power that are quite historic and cyclical. So, you know, I think that you can see these debates repeating themselves. But clearly, if you look at the fora where the Middle East and North Africa had had cooperation, they're really weak right now. The Arab League has never worked. It was designed to work with Egyptian leadership. It never really did. Um, the, uh, the GCC is not functioning. So that's a negative sign. I think that would be somewhere to look, somewhere to bolster some kind of regional cooperation would be through mutual and multilateral bodies. But unfortunately, the trend doesn't really seem to be there right now because of the, the competition that's going on.
Um, we have a lot of questions on sort of career pathways and how to learn Arabic and work in the region. And because we are continuing the session with uh, two staff members from MENAP who will be able to, to talk a little bit more about that, um, I, I think we should leave those sort of questions for, for that session as we are running out of time. But before we say goodbye to Tim, um, I always like to finish on a sort of um, optimistic high note. And if you can share maybe, I don't know, um, some closing remarks uh, from uh, your perspective, maybe an example of something that uh, works or that's a good initiative. Um, I have noticed the girls from MENAP have already shared the papers and your talks uh, recently on um, Libya's war economy. So hopefully there is a lot of material to, to go to for those who are interested to read more. Thank you. Yeah, I thought you were suggesting that the good news was our research at the end. That, yeah, that would be bad. Um, that, that too. <laughs> well, I think sometimes it can be hard not to get a little bit depressed with um, some of the trends that we see. It's hard sometimes working on these issues when um, a lot of the, the trend is, is negative. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't um, bright spots and opportunities. Um, it's hard, honestly, to look at for, for what that is right now, but I do look at sometimes and see protests in, in Lebanon, the way that people are mobilizing. And um, I think it was Hashem's um, point about the rise of a police state, but also you can see a very strong population there that's advocating for, for reform and not letting um, a regime off the hook. I think for most analysts, they always see the, um, the potential and the, you know, the uh, in, in the populations in the region, the way that they've mobilized. So sometimes there's an, an argument that the protests 2011 and everything completely failed and that's all done. I don't really see it that way. I think things work in a lot longer timeframes than our attention spans allow. We're often looking for what's happening today, tomorrow. And my, perhaps I'll leave on this point in that I think as a think tanker to get your job right, a journalist looks at what's going, what's happening today and how that will impact tomorrow. The, the academic looks in a much broader sense and writes two, three years later minimum about what happened and tells you why it matters. Whereas the think tank has got to be in that space in the middle, understanding what's happening now, how it's shifting fast, but also trying to be um, proactive and suggest means of navigating problems over the coming years. And so I think that's a good space to be in and a good exercise because it's very easy to point out what the problems are. Trying to find the solutions is a much more difficult uh, endeavor. Yes, and thank you for closing on that note. Uh, although we had a very limited time, I felt that we covered quite a lot and thank you for that. Thank you for all your insights and uh, very good luck with all your future work. Thanks, Alice. Thank, thank you, everyone. you, Tim. While we are waiting for the final session of the day, we have some strong presentations lined up from um, two of my colleagues in the same program, Middle East and North Africa, and uh, one colleague from External Relations. Uh, and uh, that is one of the um, uh, operational things at Chatham House that we haven't heard from so far. So, I'm glad that uh, she can join us too. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce Fatima, Remy and Kristen, who will talk about their career insights and life at Chatham House. And um, I believe Fatima is ready to go first. Fatima, welcome to the summer school. Thank you for joining us and over to you. Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. It's really, really exciting to be here. And thank you so much for sticking towards the end. Um, honestly, it's just so impressive that at your age, you're taking your Friday off to actually sit through the summer school. So round of applause to all of you. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be sharing a quick presentation um, about career insights uh, at Chatham House with you all and we'll go through that quickly and then hopefully we'll have uh, some time for Q&A at the end. So um, 
the topic I'm covering today is career insights uh, from Chatham House. And I think throughout this week, a lot of you have covered um, pathways into research, uh, looking into sort of how to get into Chatham House through that research and academic path. But there's so many different roles available at Chatham House. And really what I want you all to take away today is that um, to explore these sort of different avenues and that there's not just one typical path to get into Chatham House. Um, and so I'm just gonna start off by sort of introducing myself quickly. So my name is Fatima and as Alice mentioned, I work um, as a research and outreach assistant here in the Middle East and North Africa program. It's a bit of a misleading title because my job is actually more about communications and sort of uh, doing the outreach work for the pro program and sort of less research, but I'll cover that aspect um, in, in, in the, in the uh, presentation. I think when Alice reached out and she sort of mentioned the summer school, it was really, really exciting for us here in the programme because we're always looking for opportunities to share our experience, um, especially with young people. And I think, you know, it's so impressive sort of reading through you guys' questions because it's like you, you're so knowledgeable already and I'm sure you have so much to offer. So I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm learning so much from you. I'm, I'm sort of um, a bit nervous now about what I can offer, but hopefully what I'll try and do in this presentation is cover a lot of sort of the questions that you had sent at, um, Alice about um, getting into Chatham House so sort of the different avenues that you can get into Chatham House through how to get a job at Chatham House what a typical day for me at Chatham House looks like in my role um, and also just give you some top tips to take away and um, work on during the summer and beyond um, if you're interested in this field sort of that will help you facilitate uh, to get a role um, in the think tank world. So before we kick off, what I want you all to do, just 10 seconds, okay? We don't wanna span the, the Q&A beyond that, just 10 seconds, uh, because it's the last day of the summer school, I want you all to share one word which summarizes how you're feeling right now about the summer school coming to an end, how you're feeling about the week. So 10 seconds, go in the Q&A now, just share inspired love it optimistic excited happy oh they're so good anxious <laughs> hopefully we'll we'll turn that around hopefully we'll turn that around with some top tips intrigued okay that's amazing motivated oh that's so good okay perfect so good to have you guys all on high and hopefully we'll sort of give you some top tips so that you can go away um, and build on that motivation and that optimism that you're feeling throughout the week um, and um, yeah, I think we can stop now so we don't have to, <laughs> poor Ludovin and Amrit have to sort of like <laughs> uh, spam, you know, spam check. Um, for me, I'm personally, oh, can you guys see my, I'm personally very excited <laughs> to share with this. So let's get straight into it. So the first thing that I want to talk about is my pathway into Chatham House. How did I get here? Um, I, I know this is a question a lot of you have asked. I know this is a topic that you're all interested in, sort of like the culmination of the week. Okay, we've learned about Chatham House. I want a job at Chatham House. And I think one thing that's really, really important to highlight is that there's not one typical way into Chatham House because there's just so many different roles. And for me, my journey started with my love of the Middle East and my love of politics. I, I knew I always was interested in the Middle East. I knew I loved the Middle East. Um, my background is from the Middle East, so my parents are from Egypt. I moved here when I was very, very young. Um, I was born in Saudi Arabia. Um, but, you know, I've always had that connection. And um, I decided to pursue that when it came to sort of applying for university. And um, initially, I actually applied to study law at university. Um, I knew I was always interested in the Middle East, but, you know, those people around you that say sort of, oh, that's not a good career path to go into. What are you going to do with that degree? It's very niche. And so I sort of listened to all those voices around me and I applied for a safe option, which is law. And that's not to slate law at all. If you're interested in that, please go for it. Um, but I knew deep down that's not what I was interested in. So come results day, I, um, I actually just missed uh, getting into my uh, choice of university because I didn't get the marks for it. 
I was secretly quite happy. <laughs> um, and I ended up applying for um, going through the clearing process, which is a process here that we have in the UK to sort of, if you don't get into your choice of university, you can apply to a different university. And I ended up at SOAS, so the School of Oriental and African Studies um, at SOAS, which is the perfect place to study about the Middle East. Um, I mean, I had my journey with Middle Eastern Studies um, as an undergraduate was very short. I only completed one year of it uh, because, again, the voices came back and I listened to those voices telling me, oh, maybe you should explore something more broad. So I changed my degree in the second year and I uh, went into politics and development studies, uh, which was still great. I learned so much from it, uh, but I knew deep down I always wanted to pursue my love for the Middle East. And I actually tried to do that a lot through my time at university. So I tried to make the best of it. And um, I was working during the time to support myself. So, I mean, I know a lot of you will come from different backgrounds, different situations. Um, a lot of us won't be privileged to sort of be able to just get through university with support from parents, etc. A lot of you will have to work. And like, I really sympathize with that. And I'm just here to tell you that you can actually do that. You can do both these things and it can be an asset for you in the future going forward. So I did things like work in retail. I worked at Lush. Um, I don't know if a lot of you are aware of Lush. Some of you might be there. You're, you're probably thinking this is so random, like think tank, international affairs. What has this got to do with it? I did telephone fundraising for like refugee scholarships at my university. I started up my own human rights organization with my friends looking at human rights in Egypt. And all of these skills, like all of these roles taught me so many skills that helped me to eventually get to Chatham House. So what I want you to really, really keep in mind is start local. Um, there's so many different opportunities that are available around you and you can create your own opportunities through them and never ever underestimate the skills that you can pick up from voluntary work around you um, or from jobs that seemingly are unrelated like retail but that will give you so many skills. Um, you know, I, I, I learned how to speak confidently to people, how to approach people, how to um, telephone fundraising, how to convince people, how to form an argument. All of these skills helped me down the line. And so I came to the sort of end of my degree a um, few months before graduation, 2018, and I was so confused about what to do. Um, 2017, sorry. A lot of my friends sort of had applied for their masters that was secure and you know i kind of felt like oh my gosh i need to be like doing something reality setting in like i'm not going to be a student for life so i ended up um applying for this you know one day i was just like randomly scrolling through all these like job pages and i found this internship called the speaker's parliamentary placement scheme and this scheme places you with a member of parliament in the houses of parliament here in the uk um, and you work with them for nine months and you also work within the Houses of Parliament. So the House of Parliament has different teams. And I applied for this scheme. I was like, I, there's no way in hell I'm getting this with the kind of experience I have. Um, you know, there's 2000 applications for 10 places. There's no way I'm going to get it. I thought, let me just apply. What am I going to lose? Right. And a week or two later, I get this notification in my email, like you've been invited for an interview. Um, I couldn't believe it. I was like, are you serious? Like, wow. Um, again, I just sort of doubted myself. I thought, let me go through the process. And it was intense. It was like three interviews. And I made it in the end. I got one of those places, one of those 10 places. So again, never ever doubt your skills. Try everything and apply for everything. Um, you never know where it could get you. And I ended up working there for nine months um, in, in Parliament. And honestly, this experience was... I think that the, the key, the door really, that allowed me to sort of like get so many opportunities, it was, I can hands down say it was life changing. And it was life changing, not just because of sort of the nature of the environment that you're in. I think it's because I really made an effort to network as much as possible and to make use of the, um, you know, the resources that were available to me there and creating my own opportunities. So for example, as part of the scheme, like, we learned about the House of Commons library they had, and they had different research teams and MPs could go to sort of these different research teams and ask about a certain policy that was taking place at the time. And I was like, I want to work with that team. So I approached that team, I emailed them and I said, can I, you know, can I shadow you for a month or so? And I did, and I was able to actually contribute to a paper 
uh, that they were writing at the time, which really, really helped me later down the line uh, in my work at Chatham House. So always, always like sort of make sure that you're, um, you know, networking as much as possible. By networking here, I mean making those connections and seeking out opportunities, even if they're not sort of like immediately available to you, just knowing that they exist there. So that was my time in the, in the parliamentary scheme. Um, and that came to an end sort of like nine months later. Um, and again, I was sort of like stuck as to what to do. Um, luckily for me, in, in, in my role, um, a, a position became available in my MP's office and I applied for it. Um, and I ended up getting the role. And I worked with Jeremy Corbyn, who was the leader of the opposition at the time. I worked um, there for just over a year, I think. And again, that was an incredible experience. Um, I really tried to sort of tailor my role as much as possible. Again, I asked if I could like sort of work with the different re teams that were available there at the time. I worked a lot with the social media team, which is where my love for communications and outreach came from. And again, it was about creating those opportunities for myself. Um, and the reason why I decided to move on from that job is because it got a bit boring. I just realized, you know, I. I, I'm, um, I, I've exhausted really all the skills, all the, um, you know, I, I, there was not much more learning I could do. And so I was on the hunt for a new job. And this opportunity at Chatham House came up in the Middle East and North Africa program to do research and outreach for the program. And I applied and I was able to get it. But I could not have got to this point without starting through that path. And this is really, really what I want to highlight to you guys that, you know, you see people at the top that have made, made it and they're sort of like at, at doing research, et cetera. They started off from somewhere and you need to carve out your own path. And there's no typical path to Chatham House. Uh, it varies. So that's my journey with Chatham House. And I want to move on now to the second part, which is what does a typical day in research and outreach look like? And I think it's such a cliche, but there's no typical day. Um, each day is so drastically different at, at Chatham House. And even more so when you're working on the Middle East, because you know, as it happened in January, we woke up one day to the news of a major Iranian general being assassinated. And that took over the news literally for the next month and completely threw our work off. Um, so I think one thing really to keep in mind is if you like fast paced environments, you will love working in a place like Chatham House because it's very fast paced um, and there's always something to do. It's never boring. And I think that's one thing I really, really love about working in Chatham House. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind. If you like fast paced environments, definitely think about career at Chatham House and in think tanks. I think more generally day to day, the kind of thing that I do is it's very, very important to stay on top of what's happening in the news especially for a role that's like, you know, to do with communications. And um, every single day I make sure at least to dedicate, you know, half an hour, an hour, going through news articles, going through Twitter, social media, finding out what's happening around the world and what sort of the latest analysis is. Um, and I would recommend that you all do that from now. Um, get into the habit of, you know, finding out what's happening around the world and keeping track of that. And the other thing I do as well is for the program is I try and keep up in top of, you know, what's the latest digital trends, what are the think tanks doing, what are the research institutes doing, how can we contribute to, to you know, to, to our outreach um, efforts, so updating our social media, for example, that's something that I do, producing videos for the program, um, and we're in the process of launching a microsite, so working on that as well. So if you're interested in those kinds of things, I mean, I still have to have a lot of understanding and input about the Middle East. So I think that could be an avenue to get through that. So don't just think, oh, I have to go through research, academic way, et cetera. There's different ways that you can actually get into, um, into this kind of work. Another thing, another aspect of my job is sort of like conferences and events that we do. Um, I liaise a lot with the media to make sure that our events are covered properly and that we get the coverage that we need. And also just making sure that our experts are on the news, um, giving their opinions. And, you know, Sanam, Tim, they're constantly speaking to the media, making sure that we sort of monitor their appearances um, as well. 
And, you know, some days they'll be a bit more quiet. So that's the research aspect of my role. I get to help out with a bit of research and it's not as glamorous as it seems. I know Alice was mentioning about, you know, it's in the library and you're looking through books. It's not really that glamorous. Um, but it is good to do, sort of like read, start reading now, get into the habit of reading. Um, whether it be sort of like journal articles or like just newspapers, start slow if you're not like sort of used to it. And then you can go into the big books, etc. But you guys are so impressive. Like I've, I've seen the guy, kind of like questions you guys are putting forward, you're doing your reading. Um, but yeah, there's that aspect of my job as well. And the final thing really that I wanted to get into is to sort of leave you with some top tips um, about getting a job at Chatham House and making sure that you maximise your chances of getting into this field. And the first thing really, and you know, I, I thank my sister for giving me this piece of advice is she always used to tell me this, don't ask, don't get. Never ever assume that these opportunities and chances will come to you. You have to go out there and chase them. And so, you know, for example, in the the example I gave in the speaker's parliamentary scheme, I reached out to the House of Commons team. They didn't reach out to me. They didn't wait for me. They said, oh, you know, they magically knew I was interested in international affairs. No, I had to reach out to them. Similarly, when I was working in Jeremy Corbyn's office, I reached out to the social media team then. I said, can I help you guys out? I'm really interested in social media. I have ideas. And nine times out of 10, people would love to help you. And if they can't help you, then they'll actually um, refer you to someone else that might. So yeah, don't ask, don't get, go out and get those opportunities. L link to that is create your own opportunities. So, you know, I know Mohammed, he was saying sort of about in, in the previous session, how can we sort of get the voice, um, our voices out there? How can we make sure that people are, know about what's happening in, in, uh, in Lebanon, etc. And it's amazing that you're getting involved with that local magazine, but I would say explore other opportunities like social media, for example, make sure that you're active on there. That's a great, great platform. Twitter is a great platform to use to get your voice out there, to interact with others um, and collaborate on ideas and put yourself out there. If there's a publication that you're really interested in, um, you know, you'll find their emails very easily now online on Google reach out to them and say, I'm really, really interested in writing about this topic. Um, would, you know, send them a pitch. Can you, would you consider this for a pitch? Um, the third thing is be curious. I think one thing that was really, really nice about, you know, what Sanam was saying in the beginning is that we're still students of the Middle East. And that's one thing that you'll, you'll notice when you get into these kinds of fields is that you're constantly learning. And you will never stop learning. So it's very, very important to be curious. You know, I come from an Egyptian background, but working here at Chatham House, I've learned about everything from Libya to Yemen, you know, anything, you name it, we, we've sort of like covered it. And it's really, really important to have that open mind, to be curious and to always be willing to learn. Um, and especially in the digital role as well, things are constantly changing. So it's important to, to be able to uh, keep up with those trends. The fourth thing is, it, I think this is key really, is to learn an extra language. Um, the people who applied for my role at Chatham House, um, the same role that I was doing, a lot of them were way more experienced, they had better experience, but the reason why I got the job is because I had knowledge of Arabic and I'm learning Turkish at the moment as well. So use this time that you have now while you're in lockdown. This is the perfect time to pick up another language. And yeah, we can't go to that, you know, you can't, it sucks that we can't go and travel to that country, but the tools that you have at your disposal now, and you guys will be way more familiar with them than me. I feel like a dinosaur now with all these digital technologies, but go out there and like learn with each other, stay connected with each other, which brings me on to my next point. You know. I'm sure so many of you speak different languages here. If you're interested in learning a language, make sure that you know, connect with someone in the group here that you know um, and learn from each other and um, start a program. And I think that's really the point that I want to end on, which is make sure that you stay connected with each other. That's the first, you know, when we say networking, this is what we mean, network with each other, use your own networks now. And I think I'm so impressed by the level of knowledge and dedication that you guys have and I have no doubt that you will make it in this field if this is what you're keen on and really what I, I'm, I'm um, 
what I really, really encourage you all to do is that when you do get to that level, make sure that you keep the door open for others behind you. Make sure that you're available to give your time and knowledge and expertise and skill. Um, it's really, really important to, to, to be able to sort of nurture the next generation and to be able to sort of allow others to experience the very same things that uh, you want to experience. Um, and I think that's really what I want to, to sort of end on and just want to thank you all for the opportunity and time. I've learned so much. And if you're interested in our work, I know Rani and I have posted some links. Um, follow us on social media. We're posting regularly there about the kind of work that we do. And that's the best way to sort of get into the field, stay aware. Um, and yeah, that's follow us, really. That's what I want to end on. Thank you so much. I feel like I've gone so over time. I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. I think we'll have to have a very short version from Reni and Kristen, but there was quite a lot of good advice, lots of tips. And if you can start maybe answering some of the, those questions that, that arrived in our Q&A box, so that would be really great. So Reni, over to you now. Thanks, Alice, and um, thanks for allowing me to speak to the younger generation. That always really excites me. Um, so I'm just going to share also a few slides. Um, and I just uh, first to introduce myself. My name is Reni Jelaskova, and I'm from Bulgaria uh, uh, originally. And I have been in Chatham House for about four years now. Um, so how did I end up here is what Fatima also started with. Um, but unlike her, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, and I didn't really know that I wanted to get in international affairs when I was um, 16 or 17. Um, what I remember is that I was really confused and I was getting a lot of uh, advice from family and friends. Some of them were telling me you should get into business or finances because that will give you like a very good, you know, financial stability in the future if you pursue that career. My uh, parents actually encouraged me to really go for something that interests me, something that's really something that I'm passionate about. Um, so that's what I uh, decided to do. And I actually applied to study in the UK university um, to pursue my love for Japanese culture. Um, I've always loved Japanese um, culture and I've always loved different cultures generally. Um, so I went to Oxford Brooks and I did a four year degree um, in Japanese. I went to live in Japan as well. Um, so I really had an amazing experience and I learned a lot. But after I finished my degree in Japanese, I thought, okay, I think my Japanese dream has kind of run its course and I am done with that. Um, what am I going to do next? And I uh, started thinking and reflecting on my experiences. Um, I knew that I wanted to do a master's degree, but I didn't know what I wanted to do it in. Um, so I uh, reflected on my university experience and I remember that I really, really enjoyed volunteering. And when I was in uni, I did, I volunteered with local NGOs in Oxford. I uh, also volunteered with Isaac, which is an amazing organization. I hope some of you have heard about it. Um, it basically tries to promote uh, leadership opportunities for young people. I really recommend it as a great way to learn new skills and to connect with others um, from all over the world. So that's what I was doing. And I was kind of thinking, okay, for my master's, um, I really want to connect my love for uh, different cultures and for you know this international experience that I've already had with my love of volunteering and helping people and contributing to someone else's future um, and a positive development in that future. Um, so I found a very interesting degree in SOAS, like Fatima, <laughs> um, and I did a, a master's in social anthropology of development. So that degree kind of combined anthropology, the study of cultures with international development, which is, you know, the study of um, poverty of alleviation and, um, you know, empowerment of communities, empowerment of women, education, and just improving the economic situation of people in the global south. Um, so that was a fascinating degree and I learned a lot uh, from it. But as it happens, you know, you finish your master's degree and then you're like, what am I going to do now? Because the opportunities, as Fatima said, they don't just come knocking on your door. You have to really go and find them. Um, so I started researching work experiences and development. I really wanted to engage myself with projects on the ground to see what development actually means in practice. 
and I found an amazing opportunity to um, help communities and um, uh, work on youth empowerment in Jamaica. And I packed my bags and went to Jamaica for a year where I worked for um, the Jamaican government in uh, local community development. And then I also did uh, work with a local NGO called Manifesto Jamaica on youth empowerment in uh, ghetto areas of Kingston. Um, obviously, that was a very hard experience because you see a lot of kind of struggles from people and um, you really want to help. So I really felt that through my being there, through my work there, I was really helping. Um, but at the same time, I felt a bit of a limitation because development often really depends on political developments as well. Um, large development programs depend on international funding and support from large uh, multilateral organizations or from different governments. Um, so I really wanted for my next experience in, in sort of the job world to focus on um, how policies are made. How does politics work? What about international relations and how do they contribute to the development? Um, so I came back to Europe, I went back to Bulgaria and I um, started looking for opportunities in international relations, international politics. And I really wanted to get involved with the European institutions, um, started going through all the um, opportunities that were online for um, uh, internships at the European Parliament or a European Commission. But the competition was so fierce that I wasn't successful in my applications and I was getting quite depressed because I wasn't getting what I wanted. Um, so I tried to look at it from another angle. I found a Bulgarian politician, um, a, a member of the European Parliament that was doing a lot of work with refugees in the Middle East. She was doing a lot of interesting initiatives um, of, for development and um, also she was working on youth empowerment. So I thought, great, that's someone that really connects to what I wanna do and has the same interests as me and can give me the opportunity to really learn what politics is all about. Um, so I decided to just send her an email. I decided to reach out and send a very honest and sincere email about why I would love to go to the European Parliament and do an internship for that MEP. Um, and to my surprise, she responded within two hours and said, you're welcome to come to Brussels in the beginning of September for a paid internship. Surprise, big surprise for me. Um, so I ended up going to Brussels for a few months uh, to do an internship there, which was incredibly useful to see what, you know, the surface of what politics is all about. I went into uh, meetings of the various um, committees within the parliament on international affairs, uh, committees about human rights, committees about uh, internal European affairs, and I learned a lot. And that kind of put everything in stone for me, that I really wanted to pursue a, a career in international relations and politics. Um, I came back to the UK and I uh, started applying for job opportunities and got an interview with the Middle East North Africa program at Chatham House, which to me was a huge surprise because first of all, I uh, didn't know Arabic. I didn't have much experience in the Middle East, but I think that through my skills and through my passion, I really showcased that I could be of benefit. Um, so I uh, got the job at Chatham House. Um, so this uh, kind of slide is just really to show you guys that the path to um, you know, your dream job is not always straight. It's really a lot of winding roads that kind of get you to where you want to be. Um, but what's really important through that road is to um, take every single opportunity and to really learn every, to take an opportunity to learn all skills that come across um, in, in, your, in your daily life uh, and any work or educational experience. Um, without these skills, I would never have been able to uh, get my uh, job at Chatham House. Um, so I think in the next slides, I'm just going to talk a bit about what my role is and the skills that I need every day to uh, be successful in it. Um, so you've already met uh, my colleagues, um, Fatima and uh, Sanam and Tim. So Sanam and Tim work on the research side of the program, and I work on sort of the management or administrative side of things. 
And what I do is I organize events in the majority of my time. So we do a lot of conferences on various topics. We do uh, smaller meetings uh, with high level politicians behind closed doors. And we also work on um, various projects. I get to do uh, interviews with policymakers. I get to um, do a lot of analysis, which is fun. Um, but I also have to do kind of the, you know, large Excel spreadsheets with budgets. I also have to do fundraising as part of my role. Um, so uh, because we depend on other organizations to provide us with the finances needed to do our work. Um, and I also do, uh, I also just support our team in every way possible to make everything work and come together. Um, and the skills that I need uh, for that um, are skills that they're essential for pretty much any job out there. Um, and these things you develop through all of your experiences. And this is what I really want to emphasize. Don't think that you develop skills just through um, you know, work experiences. Um, school and university are so important in teaching you how to uh, you know, communicate with people or how to be organized. Um, so the first three skills that I really want to focus on are attention to detail, problem solving and organization, because without these three, I would never be able to create a conference for 300 people with, you know, prime ministers and high level policymakers. Um, attention to detail is extremely important because you need to be uh, able to look at every single thing within an event and really spot where the issues are. You need to, um, you know, solve a lot of issues in the organization of the event. You need to uh, make sure you organize everything in the best way possible because you really want to have the best results. And when you uh, are at the event, it needs to look seamless for everyone who's attending so that nobody knows how much hard work has gone into the preparation. Um, these are just some photos from our conferences and formal dinners at Chatham House that we've done. Um, and another one that's very important is communication. And communication has a lot of different aspects. Um, it can mean uh, communication with your colleagues. It can mean communications with partners. Um, it can also mean communication with very high level policymakers. And these are few that I've had the kind of pleasure of meeting and speaking to at Chatham House. Um, we've got uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel the uh, uh, Minister of State for Foreign Affairs of Saudi Arabia, Al al Jubair, and Mohammed Saleh from Iraq, that's the president of Iraq. So you need to be really able to communicate on a very high level with these people. So you need to know what the formalities are. You need to know how to um, communicate in also an effective and efficient way, uh, because you don't want to waste these people's times. They're very busy. Uh, you need to uh, make sure that your communication is effective so you get your message across. But communication is also very important when you think about networking because you want to be able to build relationships with the people that you're working with and the people that you meet. And here's just an example of the great relationship that I built with the Swedish ambassador to Iraq uh, at our um, Iraq conference last year in October. Lastly, um, there is also critical thinking, which I think some of my colleagues mentioned in, in, in the previous presentations. We talked about um, the ability to look at news and not take it as a fact. You need to be able to analyze what's going on in the news and to critically think about whether this is true. What are the other points of view? I, are they presenting think, things objectively or is there another way to think about things? And critical thinking really helped me in developing, um, you know, my own research uh, skills. And that's how I uh, ended up, you know, from zero knowledge of the Middle East to actually being able to uh, write my own articles and to publish on the Chatham House website. Lastly, I'll just say about teamwork, um, which is also a very important skill that basically without teamwork, you cannot do your job. You cannot hope to succeed in anything because you're very rarely able to do things by yourself. And um, teamwork, you know, you develop this through group projects in school, through, you know, group uh, uh, 
papers that you have to write in university through all your work experiences. So a very, very important one. And maybe you'll be lucky enough to uh, end up with an amazing team like I uh, did. Um, and you know, your, your work will be a pleasure. So my last kind of advice for you guys, I have this slide and one more with some key takeaways is to really find your passion and follow it. Don't listen to people telling you what you should be studying. Just really follow what you want to do. And that will, in my experience, that took me to um, you know, where I am right now. And by following my passion, I'm now able to you know, travel to different countries and learn new cultures, learn about new cultures. I've organized workshops in Morocco, in Tunisia. Um, this is again Morocco and Casablanca. I uh, even went to Saudi Arabia, which I didn't think that I would do in, in my work, um, but that happened. So I'm very happy that my job gave me that opportunity. And if you want, take a screenshot of this slide. Um, some key takeaways from my experience in my career so far is that first of all, yes, you need to really study something that interests you. Otherwise, you'll be really bored in your university years and you'll probably um, end up doing something completely different and you might feel like you've lost a lot of time because you've studied something that you don't like. The second thing is your skills are um, being developed through every single um, experience that you have. And I really recommend you start researching the common skills and the essential skills that employers uh, are looking for from now and try to develop them through every opportunity. Lastly, um, growth. Um, if you, you know, want to, to grow uh, as a person as an, and as a professional, you need to really reflect on every single experience and every step of uh, your way um, because only then you grow. Um, and lastly, be confident and really be brave and put yourself out there. If I didn't write that email to that Bulgarian politician, I would have never ended up in the European Parliament. If I hadn't applied for this job in Chatham House because I thought I'm not good enough or that I don't have the skills or the knowledge, I would never be where I am today. Um, you can achieve a lot with confidence and motivation and hard work. I think that's, that's it for me. And uh, lastly, please follow us on the various um, media, social media. Uh, we post content constantly and we really hope that you uh, be able to follow us there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reni. Thank you. And I know Kirsten has been waiting patiently. Kirsten, it's your turn now. Thank you so much for all those tips. Now we are going to the corporate relations team and Kirsten's work at Chatham House. Kirsten, over to you. Um, I'm Kirsten Mirzewski and I work at the corporate relations team at Chatham House. Um, you can all see my slides. All good. Great. Um, so Chatham House has many different research teams, which you've heard from this week, but it has a, also has a whole other side of the institute that handles the business and logistics side. Um, so we have an HR team and I. IT team, a finance team, a comms and publishing team, a library team, um, among others. Um, and we also have an external relations team, which is where I work. So the external relations team is divided into several different parts, um, such as a team that helps run our members events, a team that helps put together some of our commercial conferences, part of the team does marketing, um, part of the team handles relations with our donors and our individual members, and then there's my team, which handles our relationships with organizations, businesses, embassies, NGOs, and universities. The external relations team is really important to the Institute as we help with fundraising and organizing events for our members. Chatham House is a membership organization and we have both individual and corporate members. We have over 2000 individual members um, who range from students to senior diplomats to former prime ministers, such as Theresa May and David Cameron. Our 360 or so corporate members come from a whole range of different sectors, from extractive industries to professional services firms um, to charities and NGOs. We have about 25 universities who are members, so their students can use the membership to attend our events. University students can also get their own membership and join as student members, uh, which comes at a significantly discounted price per year. 
So this membership gives you access to all of our members' events, of which we have about 120 per year, as well as access to our e-library and, and all of our online resources. So joining Chatham House is a great way to network and meet like-minded like people, as well as greatly enhance your understanding of international affairs. So you can find all this information about student membership on our website. So maybe in a few years, when, once you're all at university, uh, you may get lucky enough that your university is an academic member, but if not, you can always join as a student member as well. So just very briefly, um, what a day in my life is like. This is a very idealized day. This is not what a, the average day is. Um, but yeah, so every, every morning my team has a quick, quick meeting to discuss anything important we're working on and to stay up to date on what we're all doing. Um, so I personally manage all of our university and NGO members, as well as about 80 businesses who are members. I try to regularly check in with these members, uh, let them know of any upcoming events that are relevant to them, and particularly during these times when we're all virtual, to get feedback on membership and discuss any potential co collaborations that they might like to do. So next, um, another big part of my job is to find new members. I do this through research and outreach, and through arranging meetings with relevant people in prospective companies. We generally get about two to four new corporate members each month. Uh, it's also really interesting to learn about lots of different sectors and companies that I probably would not normally have been exposed to. You also learn really quickly not to be shy or to be intimidated by senior people. Um, it can be hard, but you definitely develop a lot of confidence um, working face-to-face -face and even Zoom to Zoom. It still, um, still can be intimidating. Um, so another great part of the job is I get to attend or join webinars for all of our interesting events. Um, we have events going on almost every day, so I always try and join each week for at least a few. Um, and then lunch. Uh, when we're at Chatham House, it's great to have lunch in our canteen, and you get to know so many interesting colleagues from such different backgrounds, um, and everyone at Chatham House is really friendly, so lunchtime can be a really good opportunity to get to know someone you may not have come across before. Um, after lunch. Um, another fun part of the job is I help introduce new corporate members at Chatham House with an introduction on how to use their membership. So this is a great way to increase engagement with our members and also to work on my public speaking skills. Um, so after that, meet with a research program. We regularly meet with different research programs to learn what they're working on. And we collaborate with the researchers to help them find corporate supporters and to invite some of our members to their events. Um, it's also really interesting to learn everything that they're working on. Um, and yeah, 5 p.m. Uh, I rarely finish at 5 p.m., but this is perhaps a, more of a wishful thinking day. Um, but one great thing about Chen has is we always have fun social events going on. Even in lockdown, we have virtual book club, quiz night, and just casual Zoom calls to catch up with one another. So, I promised I'd keep it quick. So, just to finish off, um, I wanted to explain that working in a think tank may not be what you typically expect. My day-to-day -day is very different from a lot of my colleagues, and it's important to find the type of role that fits your skills and strengths. Um, my colleagues have already given you a lot of examples of the different skills and abilities which are useful in the job. Um, so I thought I would just quickly, quickly tell you some of the important lessons I've learned in my time working at Chatham House, um, and I hope they can be useful as you begin entering universities and the working world. So never underestimate yourself. Um, I know it can be overwhelming um, when you start applying for jobs um, and it can seem quite daunting, but don't ever let that deter you from applying for a job. Um, the worst that can happen is that you get rejected and the best that can happen is you get a job that you want. So make sure that you don't sell yourself short and don't be afraid to show off your accomplishments on your CV. Um, take initiative. So whether this is through volunteering at a local charity, joining a new club at university, or tackling a, a difficult task in your course load or at, at, a, at a job, throughout all stages of your career, it's important to, that you go after what you want. Things will rarely just come to you, so you really have to take the initiative yourself. Um, play to your strengths. Um, this sounds obvious, but you need to learn your strengths before you can play to them. So ask friends, family members, teachers, what they think that your strengths are. Um, and these can be really specific things, like you can be really good at coding, 
or it can be something more vague, like you're good at communicating, you're good at working in a team. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that those can be your only strengths that you have. You'll develop more strengths as you get older, but it's also really important to know the things that you're kind of naturally good at. Um, and that can help you under, understand and decide what types of job and what type of work would be best suited to you. Um, challenge yourself, this is similar to taking initiative. And uh, it's important to keep challenging yourself and make, so, make sure you push yourself forward. Once you stop challenging yourself in life, it becomes a lot less fun and a lot less rewarding. Um, learn from others. This is one big thing I've learned at Chatham House. Um, surrounded by so many intelligent and educated and interesting people. Um, but it doesn't just have to be at the workplace. Think about someone you admire, whether it's a friend or family member, or even someone famous, a famous politician. Um, and think about why you admire them and what you can learn from them. Um, think outside the box. Um, so I went to university in the US and I studied international relations and history, um, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I decided to move to Barcelona, despite not speaking any Spanish or Catalan. Um, and I lived there for two years, working for a yoga and health company. Uh, I then moved to London and did my master's in human rights. So it's not exactly a linear path, um, but I definitely don't regret it. And don't feel that the traditional way of doing things is always the best. Find what you want to do and what makes you happy. And you can see from um, both of both Reni and Fatima that they've also taken very different paths. Um, and we've all kind of somehow wound up at the same, same workplace. So don't be afraid to take different paths and, and look for, for what you are interested in. And finally, uh, believe in yourself. So I know it sounds cliche, but even if you don't believe in yourself now, fake it till you make it. Confidence is so important. And my colleagues have all said the same thing. Um, really, you should believe in yourself. You're young, you've got so much to look forward to. Um, and yeah, uh, so that's pretty much it from me. I hope it was helpful. Um, and yeah, um, thanks for having me on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen. What, what a way to finish the program. I, we've learned so much and it was so inspirational to hear all your stories. I know we have Anyaline with her hand up. Anyaline, maybe you can ask your question in a Q&A box. I've noticed the girls have been busy and have been through many of the questions which are coming through. My colleague from my team, Stuart, also wanted me to mention there are a lot of questions about learning languages and he would like to sort of recommend an app called Duolingo for any of you who are interested, you know, about the listening, writing and, and sort of reading skills. And it's totally free on the mobile. So that is good as well. While we are trying to sort of wrap up this session, um, while you are still on the Zoom call and in the Zoom room, I just would like to mention a couple of sort of um, takeaway points as well and also send a survey for this day as well. And then there will be another survey just for the whole week. Um, so the first poll is now on, on this particular day, on the last day. Uh, and we are reflecting on um, session with Tim and um, Sanam, and uh, of course, um, Fatima Reni and Kirsten. Over the week, we spoke about many initiatives that we are launching across this centenary year and uh, celebrating 100 years at Chatham House. And uh, many of us mentioned um, the Next Generation initiatives. And when you reflect on your time with us over the weekend and when you perhaps, um, you know, take, uh, take up uh, some of those uh, uh, summer readings that we, we suggested um, or perhaps think about joining us um, for some of those initiatives with the Common Future Conversations platform, or perhaps you're thinking about joining as an intern one day or any other initiatives. Um, we really hope uh, that you will, will stay and remain in touch with us. Um, so we would like to launch um, another poll just to reflect on the whole week. Um, as you know, this was very much a pilot program for Chatham House, and we felt very passionately that we had this great idea to, to run a summer school in our building at St. James's Square. But with the COVID pandemic, um, we realized that sometimes we just have to think big. And um, this was a great opportunity, I felt, 
to have participants from over 30 countries uh, in the same sort of virtual room together thinking and asking questions and challenging our researchers. So I hope you felt that spirit and I hope you can also provide us some feedback whether this is something that Chatham House should be continuing doing, uh, whether we could um, add different se uh, sessions, different topics next time. So if you can take some time and, and give us that feedback, we can really incorporate that in, in our thinking for, for, future, for future schools as well. And we will leave this poll open a little bit longer so you all have time also to perhaps provide some personal comments, some um, maybe testimonials that, that we could use when, when we perhaps uh, talk about the future or when we present our plans for, for the next school, maybe we could use some, some testimonials from you. So I would be grateful if, if you take some time at the end of, of this week um, to reflect on perhaps some of your key takeaway points some of the things that you may have learned and things like that. So thank you, thank you for, for that. I would also like to thank all of my colleagues and in particular those who have been behind the screens, Amrit and Ludivine, without them, the school wouldn't happen. I mean, they have the expertise and the technical knowledge and uh, they, are, they have been so valuable in, in making this happen. Uh, I want you to thank them for, for all their time and expertise uh, during the week. And of course, we met, I believe, over 20 researchers over the week and uh, uh, you had introductions from different teams and, and my team in particular have been so helpful in uh, making this possible and um, spending a lot of time in the office and now virtually brainstorming and thinking about the school and um, uh, helping um, helping it make make it happen. So thank you to to all. As well. In terms of next steps for us and um, for our engagement, and um, you will be receiving by thirty first of July a certificate of completion of the school, and you will also receive all the materials. So if you missed one or two sessions or maybe you didn't catch some of the presentations or you wanted to reflect back on a particular powerpoint you will have all the materials and everything as soon as we edit everything and our digital team is very busy during the centenary events but they promised me that the recording and everything will be available and will be sent to you by 31st of july so please keep an eye on, on, on that as well. And of course, don't um, forget to, we are still here. You know, you have uh, my email address. You can always get in touch with me and uh, send an email as well, because uh, I think it's very important that we continue the conversation. I and mean, this is just a beginning of, uh, of a nice relationship that we can uh, hopefully nurture. And once when we reopen our building, uh, I would really like um, for everyone who is perhaps in London or coming to London to have that opportunity to perhaps uh, experience, um, you know, uh, an event, maybe a Chatham House, or would just like to see our library or have a chat with me. So, so hopefully um, we'll be soon, soon back in our building as well. And finally, I wanted to say, I hope you will all keep well and busy over the summer and best of luck with your exams and best of luck with university applications uh, please do stay in touch and let me know how everything goes and i really enjoy this week and uh, and i'm just reading throughout your your now feedback and it seems you have to so thank you very much for being with us and for persevering throughout the week um, because if you are happy, then I'm happy too, and uh, then we um, have managed to fulfill our mission. So thank you for all your feedback and all the messages and all the support that uh, you receive throughout the week. So I believe most of you have now had a chance to reflect 
um, maybe a few more seconds if you want to send a testimonial or a comment in the Q&A box or please do send something by email as well over the weekend if you have a chance to reflect on, on things and I will also try to reply to as many of you as possible because I've noticed there are quite a few still in my inbox so um, I'll be in touch as well over the weekend. In the meantime, thank you very much for everyone and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and the weekend and hopefully we'll see you at Chatham House very soon. Bye for now.